Dr. Bannenberg. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak to you today. So I know that this is the last session. We're going to be looking towards the future, and I will uh, ask you to strap in your seatbelts. We're going to go very fast, and we're going to go to the molecular level. So we're going to go deep sea diving. Okay, so uh, I represent the Center of Experimental Therapeutics and Reperfusion Injury. These are my colleagues here just across town. And if you haven't gotten a chance to visit uh, Harvard Medical School, this is the quadrangle. And just behind this bush here, this building, is where Dr. Bazan showed you the famous picture. It still hangs on the wall. Uh, Gene Kennedy in the biochemistry department and all the many uh, luminaries in lipid biochemistry directly from this town. So uh, Harvard requires that I give this um, disclosure. Um, a conflict of interest, and I have to point out that from our NIH grants over the years, uh, intellectual property uh, arose in the form of novel molecular structures. I had the opportunity to be the scientific founder of Resolvex Pharmaceutical Company, and I have to point out that, um, that I have nothing to do with the company today, but I can uh, point you to this. Uh, <clears throat> that is that the company has reported treatment of um, 232 patients uh, in, a, in a phase one, phase two trial for inflammation in the eye, dry eye, and with significant improvements. And this has moved on to phase three clinical trial. And so this is an example of what I'll tell you today from what you hear about translational medicine from bench to uh, humans. And what's been very exciting for me is that the resolvents and protectants, the molecules I'll tell you about today, have very potent actions. And you learned about protectin D1, neuroprotectin D1 from Dr. Bazan's elegant lecture this morning. It, of course, has actions in the eye. The interesting thing in, in animal models is that these mediators head off organ fibrosis, they even have actions in adipose tissue and even in atherosclerosis, all in animal models. And they all act as agonists. They are not inhibitors. And this is one take-home message I would like to make. So in thinking about inflammation around the body, as we do every night before we go to bed, okay, uh, the ideal outcome of inflammation is its complete resolution. And the textbook definition of an acute inflammatory response is edema. This is the swelling that you see when you bang yourself. You get a very rapid leukocytic infiltration. White blood cells come from the blood. And then other types of white blood cells come along, very specialized ones, monocytes and macrophages. So acute inflammation is protective, but it can lead to chronic inflammation and the mediators in this uh, instance, the cell signals are the prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And that's very well known from the work of Bank Samuelson and colleagues at the Karolinsky Institute. Now, resolution is not a new word. We know that resolution resolves, uh, excuse me, inflammation resolves. It gets back to homeostasis. But how that occurred was not very uh, clear at the molecular level. And what we identified, and I'll take you very quickly through how we did that, molecules that signal the resolution of inflammation, the resolvins, protectins, maresins. And we call this a new genus of pro-resolving mediators. There are probably many, many more of them that are potent anti-inflammatory and pro-resolving, which is a new biological action, pro-resolving in their actions. And so for the fast take-home message as you dash to the plane, the arachidonic acid is responsible for feeding the GO signals. And what we found is that the omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA, are responsible for feeding the stop signals, the termination signals. Now, I have to take you through some definitions before going to the molecules. A mediator 
is a bioactive product, and what we've been studying is the resolution metabolome, sort of like signal response coupling. They are chemical signals, they are locally active, and they're very potent. They're pico to nanogram actions and stereoselective. Now, metabolites, which you've heard Lucy describe at some times, <clears throat> and they don't all carry function. This is an important distinction. And an autocoid, by definition, is a mediator, a chemical signal that acts in its local milieu, communicating one cell to another, for example. And so the, the term that I want you to go home with today is immunoresolvent. That's an agent that stimulates resolution. So, of course, the devils are in the detail. And for me, that's within the um, organic chemistry flask. And so what I'd like you to think about is our quest for human translation and evidence-based supplements. We really need evidence. And I'm going to take you through our exercise today from the classic definition uh, of the acute inflammatory response and the host response uh, given to us by Guido Mino. And that is illustrated here. First, the break in the vessels. Second, the need for the host to regenerate new tissue. And then third, the infection, the host defense part of the inflammation. So what is it about inflammation resolution that links so many diseases? And there I'll show you how we got into the structural elucidation of the resolvins, their precursors, the protectins, and then how we translate this to human cells using functional decoding metabolomics, and then some of the circuits in the immune response and then that are regulated by resolvins, and then uh, some very new work around infection and the role of marisins in organ regeneration. So it's been known since ancient time, these cardinal signs of inflammation illustrated here, are protective and lead us to the acute inflammatory response. But the acute inflammatory response has several directions it can go in, to abscess formation, wound healing, chronic inflammation, or it can go to resolution, back to homeostasis. Now, many, many diseases today that were not thought to have any, uh, a basis in aberrant inflammation, in fact do. Cardiovascular diseases, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. And the cell type that I'll show you, one of the white blood cells called the neutrophil, protects us by phagocytosis and killing bacteria. But when it does so, it can spill noxious agents to the milieu around the, that cell. A very good example of that in chronic inflammation is rheumatoid arthritis, or this one that we've been studying for quite some time here in town with my colleagues at the dental school and Thomas Van Dyke, and this is periodontal disease. And this is an erosion of the tissue mediated by that white blood cell that releases noxic agents and tears down the tissue until the point of losing the tooth. So how did people think that resolution occurred. They thought it was passive, and I'll illustrate that. So our experimental system was to look very simply at what's called self-limited inflammation. So what about the cell types that we work with? This, if you haven't seen these before, these are leukocytes. I made this film with my colleagues at Yale. And these cells, these white blood cells, are now congregating. This is our first line of host defense. This happens in all organs of the body. And the cells, think of them like sharks smelling along a chemical gradient, moving uh, to devour an invader. That's what they do. That's their, their job. But in this case, this trigger here was a laser that caused some cellular destruction. So even in war, in the case of being defensive, there's some unwanted side effects. And that unwanted side effects, when these cells congregate, is the tissue destruction that can occur. So the new concept that we've uncovered in this work is that at time zero, when we start an experimental inflammation in the laboratory, we also start the signaling, chemical signaling molecules that brings us to resolution. <clears throat> 
And in this case, the, what the cells are smelling, they're moving along a gradient, is one of the arachidonic acid products, leukotriene B4. So we made a very simple model on the back of the mice that's illustrated here, where you can think of it as like a pimple on your skin, where we could study what pathologists called resolution, that is at the tissue level, but then get the pus, the inflammatory exudate, here, taking a systems, what people call a systems biology approach, and interrogating the pus. And we've done that from the perspective of the lipidomics, the proteomics, microRNA more recently, and from the cellular traffic. And what I'd like you to keep in mind is that into that pustule that forms in the skin, very dynamic movement of the cells, just like in the movie. So we've extended this approach to many, many systems, including our collaboration, which you heard about with Dr. Bazan in stroke. Now, the first exciting piece of information that we that we learned is that if we put an inflammatory mediator onto that skin, cause this self-limited response, one of the molecules we pulled out and identified we call resolvin E1. And it was very potent, and it was much more potent than aspirin in limiting leukocyte entry into the, into the uh, pustule, into the inflammatory exudate. And log order is more potent than dexamethasone, which is a steroid that many of you have had treatment from your doctors. So we determined the complete stereochemistry of this molecule. And I'm very interested in therapeutics and how molecules interact with receptors. And we have found that that molecule requires a very specific lock and key mechanism to activate cells. So earlier thoughts, inflammation starts, and then it would just die down by dilution of chemical signals. The new concept is that the body counter-regulates with a fire extinguisher to turn off the inflammatory response and to limit tissue damage. And so the, what I'd like you to think about is what we coined with Sir John Saville, Alpha, the beginning, signals the end, but you can think of it as arachidonic acid signaling to the omega essential fatty acids. And this is um, a nice illustration from a meeting we had in Oxford just recently of the coexistence of ice and fire that uh, happens stochastically throughout the body. If Just so you can get the picture of this little pustule, this is a surgical picture that <laughs> that illuminates this little, uh, almost like blister, and we're doing sort of uh, rainforest har harvesting of, of structures made by mammalian tissues and then interrogating them to see if they have function. And so the, the drill was to identify those pathways in human tissues that we found in the inflammatory exudate and to do that, I'll show you an example using microfluidics and isolated human leukocytes. Uh, but our criteria is that the, that the structures we identified had to have potencies within the pico to nanogram range. We did complete structure elucidation. And today, we're using also online recording systems, growing cells on chips. And uh, then, with my uh, colleague and long-term friend, uh, Nikos Patasis to the total organic synthesis to confirm the structures that we had them right. So here is the biosynthesis of resolvin pathway E1, E2. And these are very potent molecules. And we think that this uh, made the lion's share through the communication of the vasculature with leukocytes and in the presence of aspirin. With DHA, we've identified uh, many mediators, bioactive products. So DHA is a building block of the resolvins. We identified these four as the first ones. And the protectins that we've been working on, neuroprotectin D1 with Dr. Bazan, as he elegantly described this morning. But what's very interesting with these compounds and the pathways is that they can be triggered by low-dose aspirin. And that's important because in 
medical school and most of the physicians that, uh, that you interact with would have learned that aspirin inhibits pro-inflammatory mediators. That's how it relieves symptoms. But one of the important things it does, is it also triggers the production of the resolvins and, and protectants in a specific form. So endogenous anti-inflammation and pro-resolution are not equivalent, and it took us a long time to realize that, and that the resolvents and protectins um, carry these functions in a non-passive activation of resolution. So this milieu, the cells uh, of their action, the cells need to leave the postcapillary venules to combat microbes that enter the tissue. And when they do that, some of them die, and then bigger white blood cells need to come along called macrophages to phagocytize them, the dead cells, and then take them away. So the resolvents and protectins are anti-inflammatory in that they limit leukocytic entry into the site, and they stimulate the phagocytosis and ferrocytosis, the uptake of dead uh, leukocytes, uh, by macrophages. And when they do that, they turn on IL-10 production, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine, another chemical signal, and then they turn off other pro-inflammatory mediators. And the marisins are very uh, good at this uh, process as well. Now, to be able to pinpoint all these, we put um, resolution indices together with uh, Dr. Bannenberg some years ago when he was here with us in Boston. Uh, so we can precisely mark uh, the mechanisms in resolution. So what's impressive about these mediators? They're IV active in animal models, uh, IP active, and they're topically active, for example, in periodontal disease. And now that the compounds are commercially available, the list of experimental models in which they work to reverse or relieve inflammation is expanding. And this is just uh, from a number of labs around the world. This is just a, an illustration of a colon model of a colitis and with administration of resolving E1 from EPA, there's a very dramatic reduction in the inflammation in the GI. So what about pain? In the next few minutes, uh, there's another component of inflammation is pain. We've got a chance to do some initial studies with Rurong G. Uh, and his colleagues in our pain center. And this just shows us uh, some of the COX-2 inhibitors, intethecal injection, morphine versus how potent resolving E1 is there. And this is significant because we need new approaches to uh, treating pain. So how do we know or, or how are we so confident that these uh, mediators that we find in murine tissues and isolated cells our um, human cells are, are actually going to be relevant in humans. That's my finger. There's a microfluidic device. And now we're looking at a single cell that we can isolate within five minutes from one drop of blood. And it's moving along a chemotaxis gradient. This chamber was originally designed by my colleagues at MIT, uh, Daniel Immerim and Mehmet Toner. And what's really neat about it is in one cubic microliter, we can add very small amounts, and in this case of a resolvent, to see exactly what it does to leukocytes. So the first thing that's obvious of what it does is that these cells are no longer running along. They stop, they round up, they change shape. And this system enabled us to address, I think, a very critical question in the area, which is, is it the precursor or the product, the resolvent, the DHA or the resolvent that's bioactive? And here you can see that the, over the same dose range on a single cell, DHA has no action where resolvent D1 stops the cells from moving forward. So this also gives us the opportunity to study transient and short-lived intermediates. We've been focusing on the receptors and have added new receptors in here. And uh, the reason why I want to point this out is because these receptors amplify the signals inside the cell that tell them what to do and where to go. And this is actually a key step in pharmacology. 
and I think very important part of the omega-3s. So what we've learned, as summarized here, that at least in experimental models, the peripheral blood free level of EPA and DHA is critical, and it flows into the exudate, into the pus, directly from the edema. And it activates on leukocytes a receptor on the surface, and then regulates microRNAs, which you heard a little bit about, but we don't have time to go into. And those microRNAs bring us back to homeostasis by counter-regulating signals and crosstalk so the exudate is stimulated to resolve. We've also made analogs and mimetics of resolvins, and they act at those receptors. And I just wanted to remind you with this picture, of the first picture of the vasculature from Rene Descartes, that these responses occur from head to toe, and inflammation and the immune system is very uh, economic and goes where it's needed. So this should be apparent to you that there's a normal traffic, and this is from a review we did on resolution with prominent members of the British Pharmacology Society. You have stop and go signals, and eventually we resolve and the tissue goes back to homeostasis. Now obviously, in, in unresolved inflammation, something goes wrong with those signals, and we can talk about what those uh, are, and that leads us to uh, uh, ongoing persistent inflammation. So we can uh, now begin to think about not too much of pro-inflammatory events, but rather an absence of pro-resolving mechanisms that leads us to disease. And that's a new way of thinking. So um, I mentioned to you that the macrophage is important here, and it's important in tissue generation. And so we used a very primitive system here, and I just wanted to show you this because this is somewhat fun. This is a worm that we cut uh, in half on seven days and then add back a marisin. This is done by Jess Dolly, who trained at the William Harvey. And you can then add back resolvin E1 or marisin that's made by macrophage, and its complete structure is shown here, and then shorten that regeneration time by half. And that's in a primitive organism, and I, I think that's telling us about organ regeneration. And so I think in the interest of time, how much time do I have? One minute. I want to just skip to a, the final statement. We started to look very recently at infections and do the same type of interrogation um, that we have, but with live infections on board of the inflammatory exudate. And we were surprised to learn, and I'm just going to jump forward, that during inflammation, we have um, a uh, activation of the resolvent pathways and the protectants. And if we add back, for example, resolvent D1 with a live E. coli, which is a type of bacteria infection, we can actually reverse the temperature and spare the mice from dying. That's this blue curve versus the red. So as you know, there's a great concern about the uh, resistance and of bacteria to um, uh, antibiotics, and ciprofloxacin is the one that's used uh, for treating E. coli. And we applied our quantitative resolution indices now to look at E. coli infections. And I'll just draw you to this here, this resolution interval. E. coli alone um, resolves in about 20 hours the infection. If we add in resolvin D1, we can cut that to about 12. Add the antibiotic, ciprofloxacin, down to about 11. But when you add them together, treating the host and uh, the antibacterial, you can drop that another 50%. And that's shown here in body temperature as well as in bacterial load. So the resolvins, we went on to find, actually are stimulating the host defense programs to kill bacteria better. And so we're thinking now about using dual treatments of antibacterial, antibiotics, and of course, treating the host. 
and as well as getting this beneficial effect of the resolvins in counter-regulating inflammation. And we hope that this would reduce the risk of uh, increasing uh, antibiotic resistance. So that was just recently published. Those are my co-authors, and uh, this should be obvious to you now that we're actually stimulating resolution and that we're thinking about agonists as the way rather than inhibit as a treatment. These are my colleagues that contributed to today's presentation, Nan Chang, Antonio Rutucci, and my full group in the Center of Experimental Therapeutics uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So with that, I thank you for your attention.